go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what do you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. The total eclipse, the devil's comment in the sky today. Comment? Is it comment or comment? It's probably a comment, but maybe the devil's making a statement too. I don't know. Are you going to see it? If you're in the United States, you'll have a chance today. It hasn't, it's really actually kind of a rare event, the whole total eclipse thing. Although it did happen seven years ago when it covered seven cities called Salem in the United States. And today it'll cover seven cities called Nineveh. Part, some, you know, it, it varies quite a bit, really. But the coincidences are very, very interesting. and People are still talking about it. In my neck of the woods, it's going to be cloudy. I'll never even get to see it. But in Buffalo, where the station is located, the Station of the Cross and iCatholic Radio, look out, total eclipse. It's going to be packed and very interesting, to say the least. Also on the agenda today, um, the uh, the new document has dropped, Dignitatis Infinita. In fact, right now, as we speak, there is a press conference live in Rome where they are revealing this document, and you and I are going to go through it just a little bit. We're going to just glance through it a bit together. I've not read it. You've not read it. We'll check it out a little bit together at 14 past the hour just to see kind of what's in there. I'm told they are not calling out homosexuality Homosexuality as a sin. We'll talk about that at 14 past the hour. And we will also, of course, share that in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT also on the program today. Paul Zuccarelli, speaking of Buffalo natives, he is on the program. He had a near death experience back in 2017. In fact, I think he died technically on the operating table on the on the hospital in the hospital there. I think he had like eight cardiac arrests in one time, one little two hour span or something like that. And he had a near death experience. He's on at 30 past the hour to talk about that experience and what the what did God want him to understand and learn from that? We're going to be talking about that and his book, Faith Understood at 30 Past. Again, everything linked up in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Let's pray. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. Saint Gabriel the Archangel Gabriel, whose name in Hebrew means strength of God, was the archangel chosen to announce the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ to the Blessed Virgin Mary, as related in the Gospel of Luke. This year, the celebration of this Feast of the Annunciation is transferred to today, April 8th, because March 25th occurred during Holy Week. Gabriel also appeared, appeared to St. Zachary to announce the birth of the Holy Precursor, St. John the Baptist. Gabriel appears by name twice in the Old Testament, both times assisting the Holy Prophet Daniel. Tradition also attributes to Gabriel the destruction of Sodom, among other actions, and many considered Gabriel to have been the angel that appeared to St. Joseph in his dreams and to the shepherds on Christmas night. As the heavenly messenger entrusted with the greatest message of all, Gabriel is hailed as a patron of postal workers, telephones, television, and all other methods of communication, including, of course, radio. Gabriel is honored along with Raphael and all other angels on Michaelmas, the Feast of St. Michael, on September 29th. But in the traditional calendar, his own feast is celebrated March 24th, the day before the Feast of the Annunciation, as mandated by Pope Benedict the 15th. St. Gabriel the Archangel, pray for us. And now your headline news. 
Reuters reports Southwest Boeing 737-800 flight from Denver loses engine cover. The FAA is investigating. An engine cover on a Southwest Airlines flight fell off on Sunday during takeoff in Denver and struck the wing flap, prompting the Federal Aviation Administration to open an investigation. No one was injured in the Southwest Flight 3695 returned safely to Denver International Airport around 8.15 a.m. local time and was towed to the gate after losing the engine cowling. NCR reports communion wafers found discarded in parking lot of West Virginia Church after Easter Mass. Catholics who attended Easter Mass at a historic Harper's Ferry West Virginia Church were met with a disturbing sight when they left the service to go back home. At least 100 communion wafers were strewn across the parking lot and nearby street. It's unclear who placed the wafers on the ground or what message the perpetrator was trying to convey But the church reported the action to the National Park Service Law Enforcement, which is investigating the matter. Whoever spread the wafers on the ground did it while Mass was being celebrated. The wafers were not present at the start of Mass and were there when Mass goers exited, so they don't believe they are from the church itself. And Ground News reports China providing geospatial intelligence to Russia. The United States warns allies of China's increased support for Russia during the conflict in Ukraine, including providing geospatial intelligence. China reportedly collaborating with Russia by supplying satellite imagery, microelectronics, machine tools, optics for missile propellants, and expanding space cooperation. Sources interviewed by Bloomberg reveal that China's assistance to Russia extends to military applications, particularly in terms of satellite technology and tank production. And those, those are your headline news. The gospel today on this solemnity of the Annunciation of the Lord moved from March 25th due to Lent comes to us from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph, the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, Full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of David his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I have no relations with the man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Ghost will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. For nothing, for nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done unto me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The great commentary of Cornelius Alapide had a lot to say. I didn't even mean that to rhyme, but it did. And there you go. Extra bonus for you. He says, The Annunciation, therefore, by Gabriel, and consequently the incarnation of the Word, took place on March the 25th, on which day, likewise, Christ, after completing the 34th year of his life, was crucified. Many are of the opinion that the world was created on the same day so that it was created by God on the same day on which it was afterwards recreated and restored by Christ in his incarnation and cross. Are you seeing the connection there? The world's created on March 25th. Uh, the Annunciation happens on March 25th. And the crucifixion happens on the March 25th. It, there's a reason for these things. God writes the history of creation like a novelist. It's so good. The, uh, the little Easter eggs that get dropped along the way. He goes on, Gabriel 
or the strength of God presides over the conflicts and wars of the faithful. That's his job as the archangel, as is clear from Daniel chapter 12. Wherefore, he is sent to announce the birth of Christ, who was to carry on a most severe war against Lucifer and the rest of the demons and impious men. The connections, the parallels between Daniel and this narrative in Luke chapter 1 are astounding. They're mind-blowing. You need to go back, and I think it was Father Brown's commentary that put, that really does a good job of looking at the parallels, the typology in Daniel, how the angel Gabriel uh, goes and visits Daniel at the same time of day that he visits the Blessed Virgin Mary, both of which are praying for the Messiah and the coming redemption of the people of God. And the culmination of the prophecy in Daniel culminates in the coming of the Savior, the, the, the cleansing of the temple. What do you think happens when you take the same time scale in years in Daniel and turn it into days in, in uh, Luke's gospel? You get the presentation of the Lord in the temple, the very fulfillment of what David was promised and was looking forward to. The parallels are mind-blowing and amazing. But my favorite, of course, out of everything in this narrative in Luke's gospel is kekare tomene, this Greek word, this unique and special Greek word that gave Our Lady pause. She was not afraid of an angel, unlike the shepherds, unlike Daniel, unlike the John the Apostle, and most everyone in the New Testament who fears angels when they see them because they come from the very face of God and they are on fire with God's love. No, 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 no. It's not the vision of the angel that gives her pause. It's what the angel says. What does he say? Kekare domine, hail, full of God's grace. You are full, completely to the brim, absolute full of God's grace. She's the only one. No one else in all of history has been accused of being full of God's grace. Not you and not me, but just her. Let that sink in. Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Tick, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at 30 past the hour, Paul Zuccarelli is going to be on the team. He's got a book called Faith Understood, An Ordinary Man's Journey to the Presence of God. It recounts the time when he died and had an out-of-body experience and what that was like for his wife and for his sons and uh, the witness he's had to even doctors uh, ever since. So it's a powerful testimony, and we're going to get Paul to share that experience with us coming up at 30 past the hour. We'll put a link to his website where you can get the book if you want as well. All of that coming up. Do share us with a friend, especially if you're hanging out with us on iCatholic Radio on the mobile app today. If you're on the mobile app, text a friend and say, hey, you should download the mobile app in the iOS or Android app store to search for iCatholic Radio, where you can find the live video feed linked up in the ICR premium tab there on the right, on the bottom right, as well as our documentary film on the end times, which, by the way, was in a uh, a film, um, like a film f- uh, festival over the weekend. And I'm waiting to hear whether or not we won an award. I'll let you know if we did. But you can watch that film right now for free in the ICR Premium tab. Just click the play button. And by the way, you can also uh, find links to all of our live video feeds on YouTube, Facebook, Rumble. We're on Twitter. And we cross post to a bunch of other places. So wherever you are enjoying A Catholic Take today, do us a favor and share us with a friend. Smash the share, subscribe, like, and be a part of the team. We would love, love, love to have you. But right now, uh, as we speak, there is a uh, conference going on at the Vatican because a brand new document has just dropped. The Declaration Dignitatis Infinita is out, and they are going through this document right now in the press conference as we speak. And uh, in fact, if I'm not, not, if I'm not mistaken... His Eminence Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez is is uh, there. The Reverend Monsignor Armando Mateo is there. He's the secretary for the doc, doctrinal section of the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith. And then there's a, a professor, a professor, Paolo uh, Sacarcelia. I have no idea how to say that correctly. Mea culpa. But nonetheless, that's who's at the press conference going through this document. And I thought... It's brand new, hot off the press. Nobody, I mean, very few people have probably read it by this point. So I thought, let's just poke through it a little bit. Let's just poke through it and see what we find. I've not read it. You've not read it. Let's just see what we see here. How about that, huh? 
So I'm going to be linking to the document itself in the show notes over at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. But the Declaration Dignitas Infinita on Human Dignity is uh, is the document. Now, uh, I'll just I'm only going to briefly touch on on uh, this document. You should look at it yourself, but I guarantee we're going to get some greater, more in-depth coverage of this document in the days to come. But uh, paragraph one of the introduction, every human person possesses an infinite dignity. OK, OK. Every human person possesses an infinite dignity, inalienable, gra- inalienably grounded in his or her very own being, which prevails in and beyond every circumstance, state, or situation the person may ever encounter. The principle, which is fully recognizable even by reason alone, underlies the primacy of the human person and the protection of human rights. In the light of revelation, the church resolutely reiterates and confirms the ontological dignity of the human person created in the image and likeness of God and redeemed in Jesus Christ. From this truth, the church draws the reasons for her commitment to the weak and those less endowed with power, always insisting on the primacy of the human person and the defense of his or her dignity beyond every circumstance. Does that last sentence give you any red flags? I mean, it shouldn't, I guess. It shouldn't. I mean, we would agree, right? It's agreeable. And yet you just, I know what you're doing, because I'm doing it too. I'm sitting here going, oh man, is that a setup? Are we being set up? Is there something coming? Is there a shoe to be dropped here? Are they paving the way for something else? That's what you're thinking, but maybe we should give them the benefit of the doubt there. I don't know. Let's keep reading. This ontological dignity and the unique and eminent value of every human, of every man and woman in the world was reaffirmed authoritatively in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights issued by the United Nations General Assembly on 10 November, uh, 10 December, rather, 1948. I don't love it when you quote the United Nations. I'm just going to put it out there. I'm being honest. I'm just, I, you know, I don't want you to like refer to the United Nations as an authoritative Great source of information for mankind. I would rather, you know, just stick to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, right? The divine revelation given to us by God. That would be a much better source, in my opinion. So to me, that's like, that's just another one of those. I don't love that. I don't like the feeling I get when that. As we commemorate the, the 75th anniversary of that document, the church sees an opportunity to proclaim anew its conviction that all human beings created by God and redeemed by Christ must be recognized and treated with respect and love due to their inalienable dignity. True, true, true. However, comma, what does that mean? In practice, therein lies the trick. What do you mean by that? If you mean we recognize that human beings are created with this dignity that God gives them, praise be to God. If you mean, therefore, that we have to give them a pass for all of their choices in life, well, then no, sorry, that's not how that works. So what the question is, what do you mean by that? It goes on. And again, I don't intend to read this entire document to you. It would be way too much. But point seven, paragraph seven says there is widespread agreement today on the importance and normative scope of human dignity and on the unique and transcendent value of every human being. However, the phrase the dignity of the human person risk risks lending itself to a variety of interpretations that can yield potential ambiguities. Now, all right. OK, now you're talking. Now you're talking. Um, I think you and I may agree about that. We got to be careful. Definitions have meanings and meanings, you know, really have consequences. So let's be clear about what we mean here. It goes on. It has, uh, it could yield potential ambiguities and contradictions that lead us to wonder whether the equal dignity of all human beings is truly recognized, respected, protected, and promoted in every situation. Now, all of a sudden, I'm starting to feel a little red flag there. This brings us to recognize the possibility of a fourfold distinction of the concept of dignity. Ontological dignity, moral dignity, social dignity, and existential dignity. 
The most important among these is the ontological dignity that belongs to the person as such simply because he or she exists and is willed, created, and loved by God. Ontological dignity is in, is indelible and remains valid beyond any circumstances in which the person may find themselves, which we speak of moral dignity. When we speak of moral dignity, we refer to how people exercise their freedom. While people are endowed with conscience, they can always act against it. All right. I like that. That's a good sentence. I'm on board with that. It's true. You have dignity. You're you're made in God's image and likeness. That's clear from Genesis chapter 1. But you can also choose to throw to tarnish your own dignity, your own God-given dignity by making horrible choices. Transgender ideology being an example of that. There are others. That's not the only one. There are others. But that certainly is the one that keeps coming up in the headlines quite often, don't you think? And I think this statement seems to uh, talk about that. While people are endowed with conscience, they can always act against it. However, it goes on, were they to do so, they would behave in a way that is not dignified with respect to the, their nature as creatures who are loved by God and called to love others. Yet, this possibility always exists for human freedom, and history illustrates how individuals, when exercising their freedom against the law of law revealed by the gospel, can commit inestimably profound acts of evil against others. These, those, rather, those who act this way seem to have lost any trace of human, of humanity and dignity. This is where the present distinction can help us discern between the moral dignity that de facto can be lost and the ontological dignity that can never be annulled. And it's precisely because of this latter point that we must work with all our might so that all those who have done evil may repent and convert. Okay, well, it still seems a little bit vague and ambiguous. Like, you're, you, could, you could probably interpret that same thing to go kind of one way or the other, right? A little bit of everybody can go, yeah, I kind of agree with this, and I also kind of see problems with it. So that ambiguity that Trajack Burton was, was prophesying last week about this document may in fact be true. Which, by the way, he's off today and cannot defend his prophecies. But nonetheless, we must go on. So it goes, this is finally, it is worth mentioning that the classical definition of a person as an individual substance or a rational nature clarifies the foundation of human dignity. As an individual substance, the person possesses ontological dignity, that is, at the metaphysical level of being itself. Having received existence from God, humans are subjects who subsist, that is, they exercise their existence autonomously. The term rational encompasses all the capacities of the human person, including the capacities of knowing and understanding, as well as those of wanting, loving, choosing, and desiring. It also includes all corporeal functions closely related to these abilities. Nature refers to the conditions particular to us as human beings, which enable our various co-op operations, rather, and the experiences that characterize them. In this sense, nature is the principle of action. We do not create our nature. We hold it as a gift, and, uh, and we can nurture, develop, and enhance our abilities. By exercising the freedom to cultivate the riches of our nature, we grow over time. Okay, you know what I'm getting out of that? Again, this is my first reaction. I'm reading it for the first time. You're experiencing it for the first time. We're doing this together just to get a taste of this thing before we get more expertise, advice, or insight into the whole document. But that, like, it's one of my ongoing complaints, even since JP2. The gobbledygook that gets thrown into some of these documents that only talking heads at best read is just mind-numbing to me. Like, clarity is charity. I love that about Benedict XVI. You got, you got simple, straightforward language. You didn't have to read it 10 or 20 times just to kind of wrap your head around exactly what did they say there. 
I mean, come on. This is, it goes on and on and on. It doesn't need to. It really, really doesn't need to. All right. So, uh, point number one, a growing awareness of the centrality of the human dignity. I'm not going to, again, read everything to you here. Point number two, the church proclaims, promotes, and guarantees human dignity. Point number three, dignity, the foundation of human rights and duties. Point number four, an objective basis for human freedom. Point uh, point number uh, five, the relational structure of the human person. Point number six, freeing the human person from negative influences in the moral and social spheres. And then it goes on, some grave violations of the human dignity. Uh, and uh, anyway, we're going to link to it in the show notes for you over at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. But here is what Michael Haynes from LifeSite News is saying as this entire massive document with lots of words and who knows what. Apparently, homosexuality is not being condemned. Isn't that an attack as the introduction seems to indicate against the moral dignity of the human person? transgender ideology is not an attack against the moral dignity of the human person that was our taste test we're going to have to get somebody who has obviously going to have to have read through this document with some expertise and we'll have that on the show for you this week so stick around more is coming up next we'll be right back the station of the cross has many ways to keep you informed about our programming You can view the highlights of our primetime programming schedule or the full 24-7 programming grid at both thestationofthecross.com or the free iCatholic Radio app. Just search under the Programming tab. Our website also offers a printable version for your convenience. synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. Here are your headline news. Epic Times reports Israel withdraws almost all troops from southern Gaza ahead of Rafah operation. Israel withdrew more troops from southern Gaza on April the 7th, leaving only a single division in the area as the country faces growing pressure from the United States and internationally to improve humanitarian conditions in the region. Israel has been cutting troops in Gaza since the beginning of the year in a bid to relieve reservists. Six months of combat have strained the military and the economy there. And many Israeli security experts say that they now see a greater threat coming from Iran-backed Hezbollah in Lebanon. Epic Times is also reporting that Elon Musk says X will defy order from Brazil's Supreme Court after Twitter files. Owner of X Corp, Elon Musk, said on the platform on April the 6th that the company had decided to lift all restrictions on Brazilian accounts targeted by an order from the nation's Supreme Court. The announcement came in response to reporting by investigative journalist Michael Schellenberger and colleagues David Agape and Eli Vieira titled Twitter Files Brazil. In his reporting, Mr. Schellenberger cited records released by X, formerly known as Twitter, during Mr. Musk's 2020 takeover that allegedly show that Brazil is engaged in a sweeping crackdown on free speech uh, led by the Supreme Court justice. And the National Catholic Register reports Diocese of Rome shake up. Pope Francis transfers vicar to Vatican Post. Pope Francis has transferred the vicar of Rome, Cardinal Angelo Di Donatus, to a different post as head of the Vatican's Apostolic Penitentiary, the Vatican announcement on Saturday. The Vatican also announced on April the 6th that one of Rome's seven auxiliary bishops, Jesuit Bishop Daniel Liberan Libanori, will be transferred to a new position as the Holy Father's supervisor for consecrated life. The Jesuit bishop played a key role in uncovering alleged serial sexual and spiritual psychological abuse of religious women by Jesuit mosaic artist Father Marco Rupnik. The transfer of Cardinal Di Donatus is the latest move in Pope Francis's major reform of the Diocese of Rome. The Pope issued a decree last year that deeply diminished the role of the Vicar of Rome and centralized the diocesan management under the formal control of the pontiff as Bishop of Rome. And those, those are your headline news. Praise be to God. Hey, there is a book, it's called Faith Understood, An Ordinary Man's Journey to the Presence of God. It is uh, Paul Zuccarelli, who is a, uh, a native of Buffalo, New York. He's 
from the hometown of the Station of the Cross and iCatholic Radio. Um, but he's since moved to Arizona, praise be to God, and apparently he died and had a near-death experience that's quite remarkable. We've invited him on the program to share that story. Paul, good morning to you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Joe. Good morning. Let's jump right into it uh, because we'll run out of time faster than we think. So you were on, you were in the hospital. Why were you there? Uh, What happened to you? And describe your experience of your being out of your body. Sure. So I was, I went in for surgery to have my mitral valve repaired in my heart and um, I survived the surgery. So the family and everybody were thankful. And then the next thing I know on June 3rd of 2017, at about 2.10 p.m., I was about 24 hours post-op, and I died. Wow. My heart stopped, so I had a cardiac arrest. And then um, my soul separated from my body, and my, my wife wasn't there, only my sister at the foot of the bed. So uh, my, my soul separates from my body, and I was able to watch the doctors work on me briefly. I was a total peace recognizing my own body. So when the soul looks at the body, it knows, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And then this glorious white light comes, Joe, and uh, it's brighter than the sun. If you, you know, if I had corporal eyes, if I looked at it, I'd burn my eye sockets. It was so brilliantly white, mm-hmm. and it beckoned me. And I went into it, and I don't, I, I lost all senses of gravity because I was absorbed into this light. It wasn't like it pulled me or pushed me. I couldn't tell motion. And I go into this light, and it just envelops me. And I go to heaven, and the whole light wraps me like it was holding me in unconditional love. Again, the Lord gives us words to use to try to express our finite intellects, which are very finite compared to him. I still had my free will. I still had my my intellect, but it was heightened to a level that I, I was more alive there than I was here talking to you on this show. And it was just beautiful because the love of God, when, when your soul is in the presence of he who is love himself, you have no idea what awaits you. And now that I know when you die, you live. Um, Other words I would give, St. Paul said it very well. He said, you know, I once knew a man, whether, you know, uh, in the body or out of the body, do not know, was caught up into the third heavens. He said, I saw and heard ineffable things that no man may utter. Absolutely true statement in scripture. You cannot put words on this. Uh, Some words I would try to use as attributes would be uh, the ardor, ardor of affection, a metaphysical warmth that wasn't a physical warmth, it was metaphysical. Um, again, the unconditional love. And uh, he's, he showed me my whole life, everything I did since I was a child that offended him. It's wow. known as sin. Sin. And um, he told me I had to go back. So the next thing I know, my eyes pop up and the doctors are screaming at me. above. My, they're standing all above my head saying, say something, say something. And I said, you used 150 joules, didn't you? How'd you know that? And then they're in the book. They interviewed me. In fact, the Mayo Clinic had to sign the legal form for that book to be published because everything in there happened with all the doctor's names. So they said I was fine, but we didn't understand at the time that the the tumult had just begun. You see, Joe, I was still having to go through the crucible of being tested. The next day, praise be Jesus Christ, was Pentecost Sunday. And at 8.49 um, uh, a.m., now my wife's there and our son, David. Um, I died again and again and again. I would suffer eight cardiac arrests, Pentecost Sunday morning. Wow. And for some reason, only God knows. Uh, they called the family. My, my son, Michael, came. Well, for some reason, only God knows. Every one of my family members had to physically watch me die from 10 feet away. And they say it was horrific to watch. Just the electrocution after electrocution. Finally, after two hours, they kind of called me and said, we're sorry. It's inhumane to electrocute a human being. Um, Your husband's lost the electrical connection in his heart. There's no electrical. Enter the Holy Spirit. And as you know, as uh, Jesus said with Lazarus, before he went to raise him, the sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory. So God's glory, God's son may be glorified through it. Hmm. So enter the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves our son, Michael, who was 34 at the time, to go into my room. And he sees the crucifix that my wife bought me two days before surgery. You can't make this stuff up. The crucifix he, uh, she bought me, Michael sees it, and the Lord said, take the cross and go to St. Paul's Church now. Leave. And he's in no condition to drive. So 
Thanks be to God, he did that. He listened to the voice of the Lord. He took the cross and didn't know where St. Paul's was. He Googled it and drives there. He walks in the church. He thinks it's a priest. No, there's four and a half million people in Phoenix. It was the Bishop of Phoenix. Wow. Thomas Olmstead, a very holy man. Michael waited for the, they were doing First Communion Confirmation. They were doing the sacraments. So Michael, as soon as the Mass is over, he runs up to him and he says, I need to talk to the priest right now. Sir, that's the bishop. Bishop Olmstead came out and uh, Michael lifted up the cross. It's the story of our lives, the cross. And he said, please help my father. He's dead. He's a good man. Something happened. Something happened at the hospital. Pray for him. Bishop Olmstead later told our family, I've never seen an act of faith like that. He's begging me to save your life. And like the Roman centurion. And we do know he's part of the apostolic succession. He, Jesus said, heal the sick, raise the dead. And he literally got on his knees with Michael and he clutched the cross. And he had chrism still, chrism still on his hands. He said, Paul, I felt the suffering of our Lord in you. This man's a total stranger to our family. We live in Tucson. He's the Bishop of Phoenix. Hmm. And he took the time and he prayed. He said, Michael, where two or more are gathered in my, in my name, there I am in their midst. Let us pray for your father. And they prayed and prayed. He said, your son's faith moved my heart so much. I went back to my private chapel and prayed into my Vesper prayers for an anointing of the Holy Spirit to heal you in the name of Jesus Christ. While they're praying simultaneous, this is how the Holy Spirit works, Joe, as you know. The Lord sent a man that day. A guy comes flying in to the ICU. He's the head of the electrophysiology physiology department in Mayo. And he says, sign this form to my wife. And they, she rescinded the DNR and they wheeled my body out. And he went up. My, he said, I, I can't treat your husband. There's no treatment for what he has. But I could try to rest him. He quickly ran up my femoral artery in my groin and put in a screw and lead in my atrium ran down my jugular vein, put in a screw and lead in my atrium. And I'm sorry, the, the, the femoral is ventricle. And um, he sewed a temporary generator outside my body. Then he went up under my clavicle, went up to my brainstem to kill me. So when you sleep at night, you're, it's called your ganglion nerve. Uh, you breathe and your heart beats. Just the left side of that nerve is the signal that tells the heart beat and you to breathe. He's going to anesthetize it and tried to jumpstart me and beat my heart outside my body artificially with a generator. And he shows me my chart later, and he said he's crying. He's one of the most advanced guys at Mayo, and he says, read this, cannot proceed with interrogating the device in your neck. Patient does not have a heartbeat. I got all my electrical set up, but I got to make sure those leads I put in will override your heartbeat, and I can't be sure because once I kill the nerve, it's over. The next sentence in my chart, praise be Jesus Christ, says, patient's heart returns to sinus rhythm on its own. Wow. We're standing around you. What happened? Your heart came back. I could test my wires. I took that needle up into your brainstem, and I I literally killed you. Your heart cannot work. Your lungs can't breathe. I I, I turn on the the generator, the, the, the external box, and I work out with you medication, and I get you stabilized, and I told your wife, look it. He's in a coma. He's not, he's not alive on his own. His heart's being beat and he's breathing on machines. In two days, we shut the wire off. I don't, you know, and if he, if he heart stops again, we leave him, the man's dead. But I need to prepare you for something. If, if this man lives, he's going to most likely be a vegetable. He's been dead too long without oxygen to his brain. Again, all praise and glory to God uh, on this feast of the Annunciation. Wow. Two days later, they shut it off. I'm walking around. They're doing neurological tests. A new, a new man in Christ. I'm praying over people dying around me. Um, and and it was like a transformation, a, a rebirth, if you will. That's the story in the nutshell. But we're going to get into a lot more when we come to Buffalo to give our witness to five parishes soon. In fact, starting yeah. on Friday this week. Yeah, there's a bunch of dates in the New York area, and uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to give uh, the dates necessarily because it's our audience is much bigger than Buffalo. But is there a place where they can find like any of your speaking gigs, uh, including the ones in the New York, Western New York area? That's a great question, Joe. I would direct them to our website, www.faithunderstood.org, because it's a nonprofit. 
Beth and I, since this transformation, I literally quit the world. You, You would too. If you saw what I saw, you wouldn't take anything seriously in this life. We're just passing through. We're going to be linking to uh, faithunderstood.org. We're right up against a a, a network break here, but we're talking with Paul Zuccarelli. He's got a book called Faith Understood where you can get the whole story. And he's also done some interviews on YouTube and other places. We're going to link to that in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. But after the break, I do want to follow up and ask a couple of questions about that experience. You know, uh, we are told divine revelation, public revelation makes it clear that when we die, we are to be judged so I'm wondering about that experience in the sense that was this a judgment? Was this just a taste test? Was God, what was your life like, uh, your faith life like before that moment? And uh, did you feel feel judged by God in that moment? And, and what was the real takeaway? We'll have a very quick segment with Paul Zuccarelli to ask some of those questions, get his take on all of that right after the break. But again, if you want to catch some of his speaking gigs to include the ones in Western New York that are coming up like this week, let me inter- encourage you, faithunderstood.org is the website, Faith, faithunderstood.org. We're going to put a link to that in the show notes. There's a great video testimonial there as well uh, that you can watch to, uh, to give you an understanding of the circumstances. And it is powerful stuff, to say the least, on this moved feast of the Annunciation when there is a comet in the sky from Jonah to Nineveh and all points in between. God is asking you and me to repent today. He's asking us to be faithful in spite of the insanities of this world. And maybe, just maybe, we might save one or two others in the process. Let's be faithful. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. We're talking with Paul Zuccarelli about his uh, his testimony, dying in the hospital, having to be brought back to life, but having an out-of-body experience and a journey and a journey to the beatific vision. Is it a taste test? Uh, Is it an opportunity for, for Paul? Or could it be an opportunity through Paul for many of us that uh, might need, might need some inspiration to come back to the Lord in a more powerful way? That's one of the questions in my mind, Paul, welcome back to the show. Uh, We're going to run out of time again, very quickly in this segment. It goes faster than the last one. So let me just get right to it. You die, you get judged. You mentioned something about judgment in your testimony. Did you feel like this was a tribunal? Did you feel like this was your your final judgment? Or was this more of, I'm I'm letting you experience something, but I've got a bigger plan for you? Great, great question. Uh, before I answer, Joe, real quick, on the website, the, the dates in Buffalo will be on branchescenter.org. Branchescenter.org. Uh, we'll they're the sponsoring organization. So that, that's where you'll find it. Center.org. Got it. But, but uh, to answer your question, um, just before I died, I was feeling this burning throughout my body. It was like on fire. And the nurses came in, looked in the ICU. I was all wired up. They go, he's normal. So I wasn't normal. Then I died. So um, I, I don't think you mind saying this. Archbishop Cordelioni came over for dinner, literally. And I didn't know he was a theologian. He, he wanted to go through everything would happen. And he wanted to go through my medical records. And I did. I gave them to him. And he goes, you have these? I go, yeah, I think Bishop Ohm said she'd be canonized someday because I'm not the only one he prays for. Uh, and they live. So anyway, um, he asked me some very specific questions about your point about judgment. And um, I think if I would have met Jesus Christ, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I would have been judged. It would have been over. Mm. So he said, what do you, what do you think you saw? I said, I think it was the Holy Spirit. God is wow. light. John says that. What he, what, we, what he proclaimed to us, we declare to you, God is light. God from God, light from light. And so um, this light was just the love of God. It was God himself, which is why I put the subtitle to the presence of God. Was I in the throne room? No. Um, I know I was in the ballpark. I was in the stadium. I absolutely know that. And when he showed me everything in my life, it was because I was a lukewarm Catholic, Joe. I was probably like 95% of the people in the pews, um, you know, going there to make myself feel good when I wanted to feel good about myself. Very poorly catechized. Uh, but I had a love for the Bible. I absolutely loved the word. 
And um, I was receiving locutions before the event. And they're all in the book. And, and people who can come to the speaking engagement will hear all these messages from the Lord. I was being prepared for this, absolutely spiritually prepared. And, and the impact um, on, on others around you uh, since, can, maybe you can touch on that. Oh, g- great question. We have seen major conversions, Muslims becoming Christians, atheists becoming Christians, lukewarm Catholics, Protestants, and I need to take my, yeah, I, I didn't spend, I spent less than 1%, one-tenth of 1% of my time on earth on my salvation and my soul. Now that I know mm-hmm. I'm going to die, the only thing I worry about now is location, location, location. You will live after you die. And I, be, I truly believe you choose heaven on earth with what you do with the gift that God gave you, which is your life. And um, that's all Beth and I do now. We go around the country and we preach Christ crucified. All your problems are solved at the cross, as you know, Joe. Mm. Whatever pain or suffering or trials, they're temporary. We have to stay focused on Jesus and the salvation of our soul which means sin. You can't sin. You know, and, and one of the verses in the Bible that etched on my heart is Sirach 736. It says, in all you do, remember your last days and you will never sin. Think about that. Never. So if you, Joe, if I knew I was going to die in an hour from now after this interview, if I knew that, I'd stop sinning. If I knew I was going to die Wednesday in a car accident, I'd stop sinning. Or if I knew I was going to die in nine months because of a terminal cancer, I'd stop sinning. So just work mm-hmm. it back. We're going to die. And, and, and it, trust me, it happens in a nanosecond. In a yeah, nanosecond, it's a, your heart. It's something I've talked about on a number of occasions. Uh, I get, in fact, it was a, maybe three weeks ago, there was a horrible video of a mom and a daughter walking away from a, I think it was a Drake con- concert in Philly or something like that. They were hit by a car doing well over 100 mile an hour, and they didn't even see it coming. You can see it on video. They didn't even turn their heads towards the car, and then their life was over. Uh, you just never, never know. So uh, always be ready. Live in a state of grace. Pursue virtue at all times. And then you are hedging your bet against that final judgment that we're all going to face at some point. So let me ask you this. Uh, before, And I think you referenced this in your book, if I'm not mistaken, as I was reading through it. Uh, before you went to that big surgery that you then survived and then died after, did you prepare for that surgery? Did you receive, uh, you know, the sacraments of extreme unction? Thanks be to God. Um, through the locutions, I really thought I was going to die. I'm sobbing in the Bible because the Lord kept saying to me interiorly, I suffered for you. You will suffer now for me, but I will be with you over and over and over. And I slept fine at night. I wasn't mentally ill, but I would just weep weep. And and after those locutions about being prepared for this, um, thanks be to God, I remembered the anointing of the sick. Mm. And I called the priest the day before surgery. He said, get in here. Uh, so I was anointed for the sick. And then Archbishop Cordoni asked me, why, why did your body, why do you think your body was burning just before you died? Like it was on fire. And I said, well, Maybe it was baptism by fire because the doctors told me no one's going to survive what you're going to go through. No human being can survive what you went through. Um, And Archbishop Corleone goes, I don't agree with the doctors. I think that was purgation. I think if, if, if if you are going to come in the presence of God, sin cannot exist with him. He was letting you feel the pangs of purgatory because whatever sin was left in you, it was being burnt off. Powerful. That's a powerful testimony and image. Um, and so true. Nothing unclean can enter it. Revelation twenty one twenty seven. We don't get to get into heaven and have sin. Uh, so, what's your takeaway here? What, what lessons have you learned from your own out of body experience? That's a great question. It, they're they're outlined in the book, so I go through those at the end because I, I have to leave the reader with hope. Sometimes hope is hearing other people's experiences. It's an acronym. So I talk about the importance of prayer. I didn't get that. I used to pray for myself. So when I was dead, I couldn't pray. Somebody had to pick up the baton. Intercessory prayer. In in fact, prayer changes everything. Um, The second lesson I learned was that not only does prayer matter to God, but that um, there is virtue in your suffering in life. 
because if God so loved the world, he gave. So God's a giver. Um, and when you study the passion, the crucifixion, that's the autobiography of each of our lives. That's love. That's love on display. How could God do that for me? And if God loved me that much to suffer like that, then love and suffering are inseparable. It's common mm-hmm. sense to me now. Um, other lessons that I've learned is that um, get into the word. Feed your soul with the word and sacraments. Because as you know, Jesus is light. He's love. John's, John is brilliant explaining Christ. Light, love, the word made flesh, and spirit. So he is the word. Revelation 19, 13. It's the word of God. So. Paul Zuccarelli, what a great and powerful testimony. Thank you for your witness and uh, being on the program this morning. We're going to link to the book, uh, Faith Understood, An Ordinary Man's Journey to the Presence of God. We're going to link to the book. But if you want to hear Paul talk, I mean, you're in the western New York area. Can I encourage you? Go check out the website, branchescenter.org, branchescenter.org. You'll find uh, where he's going to be in Western New York for like at least a week or so uh, giving talks. But if you want to check out his own website, let me go and give that to you, faithunderstood.org. You might be able to find him giving talks, or you could invite him to give this testimony in your neck of the woods. Paul, God bless you. God love you, my friend. Thanks for your time today. Yo, thank you. All right, praise be to God. We'll see you guys right back here tomorrow morning. Until then, God love you.